Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Adam. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Uh, you get a couple things out of the way first. Uh, I guess the... Uh, the first thing is I want to uh, apologize in advance for my mouth. Um, I'll try, um, but uh, God hasn't seen fit that it be completely uh, cleaned up yet. And um, the other thing is, is I, uh, I got to get this out of my head first before I start because I, I feel like I'm at a funeral. I uh, I own one tie, and, and <laughs> this is my funeral outfit. You know, so <laughs> I, I've been I've been tripping on this for like two weeks now. You know, it's like, oh god, I gotta wear a tie. Um, but you know, hey, the the ninth step tells us that we need to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people around us. So um, I'm wearing a tie. <laughs> I guess the uh, best way to start this is. Uh, I'm a oldest of three boys, a byproduct of the '60s. Um, I uh, I should have been born at Woodstock, but my mom backed out at the last minute. Um, I I always was mad at that because then I would have had an excuse. But um, you know, I, I spent the uh, early part of my childhood. Uh, I lived in a teepee. I lived on a commune. I lived in a school bus. Um, traveled around the country more times than I can count, you know, and uh, pretty much grew up in a lifestyle that uh, accepted, you know, alcohol and other non-conference approved substances. Um, and uh, it was perfectly normal. You know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a strange thing for me uh, to, to move into the life that I, uh, I had. Um, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Um, my role models growing up, you know, were people who partied, you know, people who uh, who did lots of other things too. Um, I was raised in Northern California. Um, I grew up basically 200 miles north of San Francisco, and uh, you know, I always had this vision of my life, and I was going to be an old man sitting on the porch with a beer and a bong, you know, and that was going to be who I was. And, and, and you know, the the people that I looked up to as as a kid, that's what they did. You know, that's that's how they were. And um, again, it didn't seem abnormal. Um, it was a perfectly acceptable way of life. Um, problem is, is I'm an alcoholic, and uh, I can't maintain any kind of normalcy when I uh when I put alcohol into my body. Um can't maintain any kind of normalcy when I'm sober, but you know the it, it's infinitely worse when I start. Um I picked up my first drink, my first conscious drunk. Um because I, I, I drank many times before this, but my first conscious drunk with my buddies in school, I was probably about Somewhere around 12 or 13. I'm not sure the exact age. Um, but a friend of mine's mom went out of town, and we had a sleepover over his house. And we went down to, um, I think it was a Circle K. And uh, we had this dude buy us uh, two big jugs of Gallo wine and, and a six-pack. And... Um, we went over to this construction site near the railroad tracks and, and, and proceeded to get drunk. And from that moment, from the moment that I, I, I took my first drink like that, I found what I had been looking for. Because up until that point, I was, uh, I was very self-conscious. I was very introverted. I was very much the, uh, the odd one out. You know, I was the I was the poor kid that went to Catholic school and went with all the other rich kids from town. And, you know, my dad was the part time janitor. My mom was the lunch lady in order to make sure I had tuition. 
you know, and I always felt like I wasn't part of the crew, you know. Even though there was only 17 of us in our graduating class, I didn't feel like I was part of that, you know. And um, that was my, uh, you know, that was the way I existed up until I uh, picked up my, my first drink. And when I did, I, 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 I was in. I was there. I was done. And, you know, I, I found what I had been looking for, and, and I ran with it, you know. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, um, within three days of that first drink, um, my dad moved us back to the East Coast, and I wasn't able to drink again for quite a while, probably about six months. Um, but the first opportunity that I got, I did. You know, and again, I had that same kind of feeling. Um, I uh, I bounced back and forth between between twelve and eighteen. Um, I spent you know half the time in California, half the time in New Jersey. Um, you know, jumping back and forth. I uh, I was born in New Jersey, and I have family there, and it was always that place we go back to. You know, and um, but my home always felt like it was in California because that's where I was. You know, that's where I I related to. Um, but from uh, I guess I guess I was my my 16th birthday was a was a was a pivotal point. Um, I, I got I got really hammered, and um, the next day I went back to California, and it didn't stop. Um, I didn't have a a, a layover of months before I started to drink again. Um, within a week, I hooked up with my old friends. Um, within a week, I was drinking at least all weekend long. Um, I know it didn't take very long for me to drink six days out of the week because I, 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 I grew up in a college town out there. And, you know, Thursday is uh, the beginning of the weekend. You know, Friday and Saturday is the weekend. Sunday is still the weekend, and Monday you need to drink to get over the hangover. Um, Tuesday I couldn't find nothing for a long time, but Wednesday was hump day. You know, so there were six days that I could justify drinking. Um, and then I, uh, a couple years later, found 50 Cent Mug Night on Tuesday, and I was kind of screwed. But, you know, I... Uh, I uh I called myself an alcoholic from the time I was 16 years old. Um, you know, I I, I kind of wore it like a badge. You know, it's like you know we we drink two cases of beer and then we go to a keg party. You know, it's cause I'm an alcoholic. You know, I didn't I didn't know what it meant, but I I I, I, I kind of I didn't have that uh that attitude that some people have. You know, never admit it. You know, always thought it was a bad thing never occurred to me that, you know, it might be a bad thing, you know. It was, it, like I said, it was it was a perfectly acceptable, normal way of life with the way I was I was brought up. And not that I wasn't brought up with morals and whatever, because I, 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 had, I, had, I had good morals growing up. But the partying was a separate entity, you know. It wasn't an immoral thing. It was something that we all did. Um... By the time I was 18 years old, I was, I, I was back in California. My, all my entire family was back east, and I was out there by myself for the first time on my own. Um, backtrack a little bit. At 16, I, I moved out onto the streets for the first time. I, uh, I spent the summer outside um, crashing on roofs, crashing. And we had this really great tree fort as a kid. It was huge, and I stayed there for a while, um, crashed on a few couches, but it was my it was my answer at that time to my dad telling me to get a job or whatever. I don't remember the argument, but he told me, just get out of here. I took that as get out. You know, so I moved out and I moved onto the streets and I partied around the clock for the next, you know, three or four months, whatever it was with that summer. And um I took it as a license to, to run. And uh I did the same thing again when I was 18. You know, I I, I ran. You know, I, I went. The whole family was on the East Coast, and I went back to California. And uh, my dad had a piece of property out there with a trailer on it, and I, I moved into this trailer. And, you know, within short order, I don't think it was more than a month or two, that the, the lights were out. 
you know, within short order. They kept shutting off the water, and I kept going out to the street and turning it back on. You know, they had that little hole in the ground thing. And, uh, you know, um, I cooked on a fire pit, um, had a couch on the porch and uh, or on the deck, whatever you want to call it, had a recliner in the backyard, and that's how I was living. You know, at, at one point I had a, I had a keg party and somebody burned my front door, so I hung a blanket. Um, it, it it sounds crazy, but the, the, it seemed normal. You know, um, I had no interest in going to work. I had no interest in showing up for normal society. Why work when you can get high? You know, that was my attitude. You know, and and I. You know, I drank daily. I did lots of other things. I hadn't gotten full tilt into the other things yet, but I was pretty much a, I was pretty much a drunk and a stoner at that point, and that was my life. And um, and I didn't see anything wrong with it. Um, I also had nothing to compare it to. You know, I didn't. I didn't. The peop- the only people I associated with were people who were like me. And. Uh, my father moved back, and uh, he didn't like the fact that I didn't have a job in the house or the trailer was the way it was. I was living with three girls at the time there. Um, he he told me this was not okay and you can't live like this. So I moved out, and I justified what I was doing as I'm camping out under the stars. You know, I set up my nice little bedroll, and I had my clothesline in the, you know, next to the creek, and 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 I had this little platform that I would go out and wash my clothes, and you know, I did what I had to do every day to to drink and 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 do what else. Now, I'm, like I said, I I was never really into the whole work thing. There was a period of time where I got a job at a Taco Bell or at a Burger King or whatever, and I figured it was a good way to eat. You know, um, I I was never interested in the whole lifestyle of paying rent and, you know, having a house, having a car. I had a car. My buddy gave me a car. It had no muffler. It had no insurance, no registration. It had a license plate so I could drive it. You know, I didn't have a license, but that didn't matter. Um, And it had four and a half pounds of pot in the trunk. So... It was a it was a it was a perfect you know thing for me. Um, I uh, I spent on and off that seven years out there, you know, outside. Um, there were brief instances where I wasn't, um, but uh. It was the day before Thanksgiving. Um, I had been living in the Bay Area, and uh, I had a job. I got a job at the uh, psychedelic shop down on Market Street in San Francisco. And uh, the owner had asked me, you know, he's like, you know, it, my interests and things like that on my application. And, you know, what kind of music do you like? And he's, do you know anything about the dead? And, no, not really. I'm basically a Floyd junkie, you know. Um, he goes, well, are you willing to learn? I said, Sounds good. I can do this, you know. And he actually gave me a job and a place to stay and got me loaded the first night I was at his house. And I was like, I'm good here, you know. This this will work. Um, I had gone back uh, to Chico um, the day before Thanksgiving to see some friends and to party for the weekend. And uh, got arrested with 79 hits of acid. Um, and I was on 17, I think, when it happened. And the uh, the cop was, uh, you know, grilling me and asking me to, you know, tell on my supplier and whatever. And I had... To be perfectly honest, I didn't have one, you know, because I was that guy, you know. I used to hitchhike down to the Bay Area regularly and and, and do my thing down there and bring it back up. And, uh, again, this is not – I was not a 
was not a drug dealer in the traditional sense of people who are making money off of this. I was doing this so that I could get loaded on a daily basis. You know, I'd buy enough because acid was cheap. I was buying it for 30 cents a hit, and I would sell enough to buy more, and the rest would go towards booze and the party. You know, and um, that batch that I had was strictly personal use, and I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. You know, I, I, I couldn't understand, you know, I understand the legality of it, but I couldn't understand why they would look at me like, what are you, crazy? You know, this is personal use. You know, they were trying to get me for distributing and all that, and they plea bargained me down to personal, personal, or the, down to the regular, the regular possession. And I ended up doing two years. Um, it was the first time I kind of realized that I had a problem. You know, I, I'm locked up. I'm like, I don't know, 19 years old, something like that. And I'm going to prison. You know, hair about as long and longer than it is now. No facial hair. Skinny as a board and walking into prison. And I was like, this, this, this don't seem right. And, uh, um, and no real, I don't want to say criminal history because I had a criminal history, but it was all petty. I was a drunk. You know, I was a drunk and a stoner. I, I didn't carry a gun and I didn't rob people. And that's the way I, I looked at it. You know, um, so I, uh, I realized there was a problem. And, and I remember writing letters and, and talking to everybody and, and, and trying to get somebody to understand that I needed something more than jail. You know, I, I need to go to rehab. I need to go to some kind of treatment or whatever. And, and I knew that I had a problem. The day that I got released, within 20 minutes, I had a six-pack. Within two hours, I had a half ounce of weed down my pants, two hits of acid in my system, and a bottle of schnapps in my back pocket. I just spent two years in jail over this, and it never crossed my mind when I got out that I just got out. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't be doing this. I hadn't even seen my parole officer yet, and I was sleeping under a bridge that night. I called my parole officer the next day, and I said, I need to get out of California. Um, I have family in New Jersey. Can you send me there? You know, transfer my parole. And, you know, my theory was is that people back here work. You know, and that there's, you know, there's more to life than sitting on an editor tube with a, you know, a, a, a cooler floating behind me, you know, all summer long. You know, because that's how I spent my summers. I spent my summers in an inner tube on the river with a cooler floating behind me. And uh, so I figured I needed to do something. So I came back east. And uh, I spent, that was my first introduction to some kind of normal society, I guess you would call it. Um, I moved in with my mom and her husband at the time, and they were uh, they were sober in the rooms. And they didn't tell me I had to go, but they told me I couldn't get high in their house. I couldn't drink, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything, and, and if I was to come back to that house loaded, I'd be out. I don't think it was a week that I made it. Um, it might have been, but I don't think so. Um, I did get a job, I did manage a little bit to, to, to try and, uh, function there. I think I made it long enough to get a girlfriend that would take me in. I think that's about what it was. It, uh, um, because me and this girl, we moved in together. She had a nice chunk of money. She had gotten in an accident, and they gave her a bunch of money. And uh sounds good. You know, I can party. I don't have to work. I can go look for a job. You know, and I, I, I was willing to do that. You know, on... Um, but my main focus was how do I continue to live the way I'm living. Um, that lasted for about two years. Um, right around that point, before I moved in with her, oh, that's right, when I moved in with her, or right before I moved in with her, my mother gave me the option to go to detox or get out. And it was my first time going to detox. 
And uh, I remember answering that questionnaire. There's like 12 questions or 10 questions, you know, uh, about whether you're an alcoholic or not. And I answered every one of them except about two. And uh, my response to this was, well, maybe I'm a potential alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. I think the, 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 the grading on it was is if you answer one or two, you're an alcoholic. I, I had it flipped. You know, I, I'm potential. I, I, I you yeah. know, yeah, I drink in the morning, but, you know, it, 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 it's not because I have to. You know, it's not because I have to, you know. And that was a big thing when I first started going through the steps. I couldn't understand craving. You know, it took me a really long time to get a grasp on the craving because I never tried to control my drinking. You know, I never tried to drink a couple and stop, you know. And uh, when it was first pointed out, I really scoured my brain and I did find one instance I found one instance in my life where my girlfriend had uh, told me she'd withhold sex if I didn't uh, if I drank too much that night. So only have a couple. So I did, and um, I uh, I had to look at my behavior that night. That's what was suggested to me. Was look at how I was acting that night. Was I I was was I a happy go lucky guy who was had a little buzz on or you know no I was a I was a miserable asshole who wanted to drink. You know, and he said, yeah, that's the craving. That's your body telling you you need it. And since that point, I've been able to recognize it. I've been able to see where the where the alcohol kicks off this allergy. But at the time, when I first was going into it, I never wanted to stop. I never wanted to control it. There was no point to having a couple. You know, the only reason to drink was to get loaded. And that's the way I looked at it. But, um... What really caused this whole collapse or whatever was that I uh, I was with this girl and we were going to get married and uh, she left. Yeah. She wasn't putting up with it no more. You know, she wasn't tired. She she put up with it for a really long time, um, and uh, she wasn't anymore. She started to get sober. I started to get sober. She got sober. I couldn't. Yeah. You know, um, I went to my uh I went to my parole officer. They were gonna violate me anyway. So I went and I figured I got a problem, I need to go to detox. And so I went to detox. I I, I went to a uh they sent me to this place uh called the Damon House in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And this is one of those places where they make you wear a dunce cap and you know, a diaper and stand in the corner and shit like that. And uh, and I was there for like an hour for the intake thing, and I and I was like, I called my parole officer. I said, you send me back to the joint or give me give me another day to find something because I won't stay in a place like that. You know, there's no way. You know, you don't have locks on the doors, and you're going to make me wear a diaper. It's not going to happen. Um. So I ended up going into the Salvation Army, and uh, it was probably the best thing ever for me because when I walked in that door. The first thing they told me is you got to find God. Yeah. And I believed in God. And I believed in God my whole life. But I just believed that I was fucked. You know, um, I, I, from the time I was in the third grade, I thought I was going to hell. You know, I figured I was done. You know, I, I think third grade I got caught with the dirty magazines in the bushes by the nun. You know, and, you know. <laughs> You know, sometime, sometime around seventh grade or eighth grade, we did the, you know, the, the burning bag of crap on the nun's doorstep and, you know, and all this stuff. And I figured I was screwed, you know. And I also didn't necessarily buy into the, the particular theology that I was being taught, you know. And they told me, if you don't believe in that, you're going to hell. So, you know, I, I, I figured I was screwed. Um, but I had gotten, I was getting sober and I was reading the literature and I was hearing about the God as we understand him thing. And so I figured I'd give it a shot, you know, and being the good Catholic boy I was, I became a witch. Um, <laughs> no rebellion there. Um, 
But what I did is I actually walked around this place and I and I and I and I and I talked to guys that were that were reading spiritual literature and I, I talked to guys that had different beliefs and I talked to everybody and I and I found the common denominators. I found the common thread. It was throughout all their beliefs. And in the very beginning that was my higher power. My God was just a set of principles in the very beginning. You know. Today it's more than that, but it's not much more than that. You know, but in the beginning, it was this set of principles, um, and and it was enough. You know, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, um, got a real great buzz off of getting sober, and you know, life is awesome, and this and that and the other thing, and uh, they kept telling me to talk about my reservations and this and you know, got to talk about your reservations, got to talk about your reservations, and I never got in trouble over smoking pot. It was always the booze. It was the hard drugs. You know, the weed never bothered me. Um, I talked about it, and I talked about it, and I talked about it, and I got high. Um, they didn't tell me to do anything about this reservation. They just told me to talk about it. You know, I was supposed to share about this stuff. You know, the healing's in the sharing. Um, well, I, uh, I continued to go to AA. You know, and I don't know who told me this, but I got to thank him, whoever he is out there. They said, don't drink and go to meetings. But if you do drink, go to a meeting anyway. You know, and uh, I never stopped going. I was loaded every single day, except for little spots here and there for three years. Going to Alcoholics Anonymous, sharing about my problems. Um, oh, the weed thing. I thought I was sober. I, you know, because I hadn't picked up a drink, you know, and it's AA, you know, we, we, we don't talk about drugs here, you know, and, and it, it's okay, you know, it's a natural herb, I'm going to be a Rastafarian, I'm going to smoke dope and be spiritual. I couldn't do it. I, I, something in me, I don't know where it was, but it was somewhere inside of me was just eating at me. You know, there was a hypocrisy there. And I didn't outwardly know it at the time, because I truly believed my bullshit, you know. But I didn't, you know, deep down, I, I knew I was full of crap, you know. And because I was also sharing, too, you know. And I'm telling this great stuff that you're supposed to do, because I've been around the rooms for three years, and I, I know all the right things to say, you know. Uh, you know, I've been to a million and one step meetings and this and that, and but I wasn't doing anything, and I knew I wasn't. I, I knew I wasn't, and uh, so in my deluded state, um, I hadn't relapsed, so I needed to go out and drink so I could come back to AA. <laughs> no lie. <laughs> No lie, that's exactly how I felt. I need to go out and drink so that I can come back to AA. Um, I picked up a drink and I couldn't stop for three years. Going to a meeting every single day. Going to two, going to three, going to four meetings every single day. Sharing about my problems, you know. I had a sponsor, he drove me to meetings. You know, I had a network of people, you know. They drove me to meetings. We hung out at the diner. We went bowling. You know, I shared about the problem of the day. You know, I, I did everything they told me to do. I made coffee. Shit, I even chaired a couple meetings. But I couldn't stay stopped for more than a couple days. You know, I remember sitting in this Monday night meeting, and I'm, I'm just back off a run. I'm like a day, maybe two days sober, and and I felt like this hollowed out eggshell you know and and if you you just even touch me i'm done you know i'm just going to shatter into a million pieces and um that was my problem you know booze was never my problem booze has always been my solution my problem is being sober i don't know how to be sober i've got this um and talk about it the spiritual malady you know i got this uh It's unmanageability is what it is. You know, um, it drives me crazy. And, and if somebody believes different, bop till you drop. But you know what? The unmanageability in my life has nothing to do with the crashed cars or the lost jobs or the lost relationships or the pissed off 
whoever. What the unmanageability is, is the unmanageability is something that goes on inside of me. You know, and they talk about it on page 52. It's having trouble with personal relationships, afraid of misery and depression, can't control our emotional natures. We've all read it. You know, it's, it's that internal crap. You know, and that's the stuff that drives me to drink. That's the stuff that drives my obsession. You know, because the only thing that I know up until this point to fix that is to get loaded. You know, and I have this obsessive mind that tells me it's okay. I have this, this, this mind that tells me that it won't happen this time. Or, you know what? Fuck it. You know, I, I, my last run, they, they think the drink through. Well, my last run, I'm living in East Orange, New Jersey. And uh, if anybody knows East Orange, uh, it's, it's, it's the hood. You know, it's right next door to Newark, and it's just as bad. And, you know, me and my girlfriend at the time are the only white people in this neighborhood. You know, and like I said, I thought it'd be cool because I'm a Rasta who smokes dope and is spiritual. You know. <laughs> My last run, okay, well, I'm going to go to the bar. I'm going to have a couple shots of tequila. Then I'm going to stop at a liquor store. I'll get a, I'll get a couple bottles of Mad Dog. Um, I'm going to make my way up to uh, Woodstock or wherever they were having that Woodstock 94 thing. And, and I'm going to go to the concert. I'm going to hop on a bus. I'm going to make my way out west. In a couple of years, maybe I'll hit a meeting in Berkeley. I thought the drink through. This is the mind that I'm working with here. Because I thought that that was a good idea. You know, they told me things to drink through. I did. And I did it. You know, I, I didn't follow through with the way I planned. But you know what? It, it was just as bad. It was just as screwed up. You know, but the idea was, is the mind that I'm working with at that point, I can't think to drink through. There's no way. You know, because the booze is my answer. It's an old guy who was coming around AA or was in AA for God knows how long. He had like 50 years or something. He was two days older than dirt right next to God. And uh, he used to talk about grabbing drunks off the street and bringing them back to his house and reading them the big book and, you know, getting them sober, drying them out. And uh, at that point, I had no idea what he was talking about because... My idea of what the big book was was a book of stories that you're supposed to identify with. And, you know, we talk about how we drank like them and, you know, and, and all that stuff. And he, and he said sobriety is a gift from God. And what we do with it is our gift back. And during that last run, his face kept popping into my mind. And those words kept popping into my head. You know, and, and it drove me insane. And... um on September 6th, the uh, day after my birthday, 94, I think, um, I'm still shot. Um, it's never five years to get your brains back. It's bullshit. Um, it, I'm still waiting. Um, I think it was 94. Um, somebody could do the math for me later. Um, I uh, crawled out of a basement and... Uh, wrecked mentally, emotionally, spiritually, lost my apartment. Um, and I'm walking down the street, and I was like, i got to go back to the rooms. And uh, I walked about two miles to a meeting, and uh, it was a big book meeting. And they read uh, that, movie, that, that story about the old lady, um, Southern something or other. But it was, it was an old lady uh, from the South. You know, I'm a skinny young guy from Northern California, but I identified with everything in this story. And something happened that day. Um, something clicked. Um, I got a moment. Um, I started reading the book, and what Bill had said to me, the, the old guy, um, came back. And I started reading it, and I seen the part in the very beginning when it talks about it being a textbook. And uh, I knew what that meant. First time I ever seen it. It's been, been around AA for over three years. Been in it as best I could for three and never seen that, never caught that. 
and uh, proceeded to read that book and do what it said. Um, I got sober in the beginning, very much like the founders, in the sense that I got mail order sobriety. You know, I read the book and I did what it said. My sponsor at the time told me I'd drink if I wrote a four step. Um, he told me, you're not ready for that yet. Yeah. That's what he said. He said, you're not ready for that yet. You'll drink. And I said, I'm drinking anyway. What does it matter? You know, let me try. It's the only thing I haven't done, you know. And, um, did my fourth and fifth step. I was two months sober. Um, I got a, I got a, I got a, I got a major God shot right around that point, um, two, three months sober. And, and, and it was, it was massive to me at the time looking back, you know, and whoever out there might hear this may not think it's that big of a deal, but I was sitting in a meeting and I, uh, realized for the first time in my life that I don't ever have to drink again. And it was an extremely unique thought. I had never heard it before. I'd never thought it before. I was that guy who was sitting on the porch with a beer and a bong, you know. And later on, I was that guy who was in and out of AA living in the park down the street, you know, because I can't get sober. I thought I would, because by this point, I had introduced a whole bunch of my friends who were active to AA, and they were getting sober, and I wasn't, you know. Um, I figured I was constitutionally incapable. I'm one of these people who just can't get it. Um, everybody around me is getting sober. I can't. But that day, I'm sitting in that meeting, and it, and that thought just came in, and it crowded everything else out, and it said, you, you don't ever have to do this again. And uh, I finished uh, all the amends that I was capable of at that point, you know, that I knew of or that I was willing to look at in that first year. Because that first inventory that I did was crap. Um it's probably 80% lies, but it was absolutely as honest as I could be as, at the time that I was doing it. It absolutely was because I was truly seeking the solution. Like I said, I was incapable of being honest. I was deluded. I was shot out. I couldn't remember squat, and I was hallucinating on a regular basis. Um, acid flashbacks, not schizophrenia or anything like that. I just, but... I, you know, I, I was incapable of being truly honest, you know, I, I, but I was as honest as I possibly could be, you know, there's a line in the, in the book that says, God doesn't make too hard terms for those who seek, you know, and I'm a prime example of that, you know, because I was screwed up, I had no guidance, I was full of shit, but I was trying to find God, and, and it worked. You know, um, like I said, I finished the amends from that inventory within my first year, and I proceeded to become this rabid step Nazi. You know, <laughs> I would, I'd walk into a twelve and twelve meeting with my big book under my arm, and I and I and I tell everybody how they're doing it wrong. You know. And, and I'd go to every meeting I went to, and and stand up here. And, you know, you guys don't, you're not doing it right. This is the right way. You know, and uh, I did that for a long time. You know, it took me to fully get balanced with that. probably took me about six years. Um, I started to find some balance with it at around four years sober because I bumped into some people who were actually doing it. Um, I spent four years, like I said, in Alcoholics Anonymous, sober, doing the steps, and not having any guidance. And the only way that I was going to get any guidance, and this is what I did, was I would go to a meeting and find that guy who was in and out for 15 years who couldn't stay sober, and I'd drag him back to my house, bring him through the steps, and then use him as my accountability. You know, um, I don't know if it's in the book. I think it is, but... Somewhere, wherever I got it, it says create the fellowship you crave. You know. Um, we started our first house meeting right around a year, somewhere around there. Um, still have one today. The last house on the block, that's my living room. Um, I do have an outside group that I go to 
Um, I, I, we, I go to uh, A Way Out in Tannersville on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Um, I need outside accountability because I found that my house meeting is great. I love it. It saves my ass all the time. But what happens on occasion is when I'm not well, I let them put me in the guru spot. And I don't know when I'm not well, you know, unless I got people outside to tell me what's going on. Unless I got people, you know, that that see me regularly and that I allow to hold me accountable outside of my sponsees and the people who come to me for guidance, you know. Because that's what was happening, I found, in the beginning. You know, um, in the beginning, I, I, I didn't have the sponsor who was who I was accountable to. Um, I had a bunch of sponsees that I would bounce shit off of. And out of necessity, that's what I had to do at the time. But when I was four years sober, I, I stumbled across this group and uh, met this guy. Um, we used to call him Anal Dave. Um, he, he, was a, he was an airline pilot, and he was in the military. And, and he was a big book thumper. I mean, hardcore big book thumper. Um, and he handed me this sheet, and it was color coded with page and paragraph number. It's the Cliff Notes. I still hand it out today. It's the Cliff Notes to the Big Book, and it's got everything in it that you need to know. And um, I met him that night, and I asked him to be my sponsor, and uh, we proceeded to do some work. Um, He's no longer my sponsor. I, 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 I believe, and this may change tomorrow, but and I was also taught that uh, each time I go through the steps, I'm having a new experience. I'm, I'm looking for a new experience. Doesn't mean my old sponsor can't give me that, but I've found that I, I work better when I find someone new and have their spin. And, and and utilize their experience. Um, I'm still in contact with him. I'm still in contact with the three others since him. You know, um, one of the most awesome experiences I ever had, and it was a profound changing experience, was there were these two guys at my old home group. And I used to look at them like they were, they were like, you know, I was in awe. You know, they were so spiritual and they, they knew all this stuff and, and they, and they, you know, they practiced this thing perfect and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, we proceeded to do a three way fifth step on a, on a Sunday afternoon. And we all brought our inventory to the table and we all shared our inventories with each other. And, uh, it blew me away. Because I realized these guys are just as screwed up as I am. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they may have it in different areas, but they're just as screwed up as I am. And uh, it changed AA for me. You know, I believe it's in the vision for you. It talks about going shoulder to shoulder. You know, and I'm a firm believer in that. You know, the, there are no gurus in AA. You know, there's nobody who's more spiritually evolved. We're just on different paths and at different points in our recovery. But it's not about spiritual evolution. It's about it's just about moving through the day and 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 practicing this stuff to the best of our ability. And we all, I don't care who you are, we all have our stuck points. You know, we all have areas of our lives that are still have some kind of unmanageability. Maybe not today, but it's still there. You know, I had a great day today. Yeah, when I sit down and do my nightly review tonight, I'm so far, I don't really have anything on there. It's been a great day. Last week I was an asshole. You know, it's just, it depends on the day. You know, it depends on what I'm doing. You know, um, but I've also, been graced, you know, big time. You know, I, I identified myself when I walked up here as a recovered alcoholic. And the reason that I do that is because those 10-step promises have come true in my life. 
I haven't thought about picking up a drink in about 12 years. You know. And I drank no matter what. No matter what you threw at me, whatever consequence was standing in my face, I was still going to get loaded. Like I said, I got out of prison and within 20 minutes I was high. You know, I, I, I drank no matter what. And I haven't thought about picking up a drink. It hasn't occurred to me that it would be a good idea to pick up a drink in over 12 years. And I don't hide from it. We have a Christmas party every year and my in-laws bring booze. They don't bring a lot, but they bring booze because they drink. Doesn't bother me. I'm not saying that you need to do that. Do whatever works for you. But that's what happens in my house. When I got married, we served alcohol at our wedding. We didn't have it in our glass. You know, and we had a sober table for the people who or a sober section for the people who were sober, you know, because half the families in AA and the other half should be. You know. <laughs> and <laughs> got one of those families, you know. She's Irish and I'm Italian. I, it, it, it works that way. Well, I'm not really Italian. I'm more, I've got more of the Celtic in me, but I used to like the Italian aspect because of the food. But, uh, <laughs> my grandma's from Italy, but that's, what does that make me a quarter? <laughs> but, um, we've ceased fighting everything and everyone, even alcohol. Yeah. And I've been restored to sanity when it comes to booze. Lots of other areas, I'm uh, I'm nowhere near sane. You know that whole issue with wearing the tie. You know that's an insanity part of my life. I'm still attached to being that dirty hippie with no shoes and overalls. You know I I I I, I I'm very uncomfortable dressed up. Is that an agnosticism in my life? Maybe it is. You know maybe I need to do some work on it. I don't know. Doing it. You know. I'm walking through the fear. You know, and that's what I was taught. I was taught that this is, you see, it's a practical program of action. You know, I'm not going to go sit on a mountaintop and meditate for 23 hours of a day. I'm going to live my life and I'm going to practice this the best I can in all my activities. You know, it doesn't matter so much what I do here. You know, what I do in a meeting it, it, it is whatever. It's what I do in the other 23 hours out of the day. It's when I'm in the supermarket, and it's when I'm with my kids, and it's, and it's when I'm, you know, stuck in traffic. You know, that, that's where that's where the the real deal happens. That 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 first big book sponsor I had um, said something to me, and, and and I didn't get it at the time, and I do today. He said the 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 12 steps are not the answer. What the 12 steps do is they get me to the starting line. They get me to where my feet are at. And then the real answer is practicing this, bringing it out into the world. You know, the original manuscript said we, uh, we, having had a spiritual experience as the result of this course of action, we uh, carry this message to others, especially alcoholics, and practice these principles in all our affairs. So if we're supposed to carry this to others, it's not about booze. It's about reliance and dependence upon God. And that's the real deal. That's what it's about. That reliance and dependence upon God needs to travel into all my area, all the areas of my life. Uh, my, uh, my wife's uh, old sponsor used to say that God is very polite. He doesn't come where he's not invited. You know, and, and, and I like that. I really do. Because... It makes me accountable. You know, I, I gotta ask God to come into these areas. I gotta ask God to enter my life. You know, um, that whole recovered state. You know, I'm recovered today, but you know what? I can wake up tomorrow and say, screw you, God, I'm gonna do whatever I want. And I'm gonna get drunk. But if I wake up tomorrow morning and I say, God, what do you got for me? You know, what do I need to do today? How can I be of service? I don't ever have to drink again. And it's an awesome way of life. You know, all that shit that goes on out there. My job is to be of service. That's what it is. How I make money, how I interact, how I do these other things. It's all just stuff I do. My job is to be of service. And that's how I try to live my life. You know, we, we, we have this, this house meeting thing 
And it started off as this simple little big book study in order to get accountability from people. Um, has turned into something completely different. Um, it's turned into, and we were looking at it the other day, we were actually talking about it. It's like a safety net in my life because I can't get away from AA. You know, because AA is not at the church down the road. AA is in my living room. My kids, I've got four kids. My two oldest know what I do. They know about the 12 steps. You know, we had a, we had a home group years ago, and uh, they used to ask in the beginning of the meeting, um, you know, is there anybody out there who's willing to bring somebody through the 12 steps? My kids would raise their hand. You know, <laughs> we all giggled and laughed. But, you know, Mike, the, the guy who was chairing the meeting, said, yeah, they'd probably do a better job than a lot of people we see in the rooms. You know, because the idea is these kids were raised with it. It was they, they were brought up in it, and we never hid it from them on any level. You know, as they got older, we stopped with some of the wet ones in the house. You know, I told the guy the other night he's allowed to bring people, and the only requirement is you don't bring a disrespectful wet one. Because when you get a disrespectful wet one, the kids are harmed. You know, you could be drunk, you can be high. We've had people nodding on heroin in my living room. But they were mellow, they were quiet, they were listening, they needed to be brought to detox. And that's why they were there. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous happens out there. This is just a place we go to find newcomers. You know, that's what I was taught. I don't, I don't, I haven't been to a meeting in many, many years. I, I don't know when, because I need my medicine. You know, I used to hear that all the time. Meetings for my medicine. And I, you know, I, I may only need one or two meetings a week, but I don't know which ones. I, I, I don't get that. I don't, I don't use AA in that way. I don't use the meetings in that way. The sole purpose for me to go to a meeting is to find a newcomer that I can be of service to. You know, what can I bring? Not what can I get? Now, now for people out there who are new, go to as many as you have to and get as much as you can. But if you're still doing that three years into the into the deal, if you're still doing that two years or five years or however long into the deal, you're missing the point. You know, because if 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 we're actually practicing this program, if we're doing this thing, we don't need a meeting to stay sober. We need God. You know. Now, granted, you know this goes back to my sponsor, back that same old one. He, he, he like I said, most influential. Your sponsor is not going to keep you sober. The twelve steps are not going to keep you sober. Meetings are not going to keep you sober. But what those things are, they're all spokes in the wheel. And if you pull one out, the wheel is going to get a little weaker. If you pull two out, eventually it's going to fall apart. You know. I do come to meetings to get plugged in if I'm not spiritually okay, you know, and I can't get a hold of anybody or whatever. I go to a meeting. But again, I go to a meeting to find a newcomer because that's how I get better. My problem is me. My solution is you. You know, and it's, that's, that's the nuts and bolts of it, you know, because I can't think about my own crap and I can't think about me if I'm trying to help you. And my problem is thinking about me. You know, selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of all our trouble. You know, it's not the booze. You know, I have an addiction to self. You know, still to this day, you know, I do. i, I, I got to be honest, you know. I know for a fact that if I turn my will and my life over to God and I, I, I ask him, what do you need me to do today? And, and, and I practice this stuff, my life's going to go great. And I also know for a fact that if I say, screw you, God, I'm going to do whatever I feel like, and I'm going to act on my own wants, my life's going to suck. But I still try to do that. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's the nature of me. Maybe that's the nature of us. I don't know. But I know that that's the constant struggle that I have on a daily basis, is, is to do what I know is best. <laughs> you know, What I know is best is to seek God and to do what's placed in front of me. It's, uh, you know, wow, okay, this is a, this has been a really good experience, really awesome meeting, I like the fact that it's outside, and, and, and wearing the tie wasn't so bad, <laughs> and, and I, and I hope I brought you a good message, and, uh, 
That's all I got. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.